I've continued to look at this Emerson 1940s era tubed radio and I've done some research online and was ultimately able to determine that this is a model probably from the early 1940s and I believe that this is a model EC336 which is probably 1941 or possibly even earlier era chassis. So that's interesting. I've never worked on a tube radio from the 40s. Most of my work to date has been on radios from the 50s and 60s. I was able to find online uh, through two sources a schematic. Uh, one of these is from the Beitman Supreme Publications um, uh, book entitled Manual of 1942 Most Popular Service Diagrams. And this is one page that has the uh, parts, uh, most of them, not all of them. Uh, interestingly, the voltages at different tie points, uh, alignment procedure, and then of course the schematic. The other source I was able to find, uh, which is you know, much more difficult to read, is from the writer's uh, manual. So a few things here before we get on with this. Uh, one of the things I mentioned was that the tuning knob was loose. And um, as I looked at that more closely, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, as you can possibly see here, this is just a mechanical connection with the string that then goes up and is responsible for uh, turning the dial that you see. So there's nothing wrong with that being a little loose. This works fine and uh, with so many of these things if it works you're better off not messing with it at all. So that's just going to stay the same. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other other things that uh, I found is if you just kind of look at this um, get a pointer here. So you can see that some of the connections are very bright. So this solder connection here and here uh, and then also this one right here. Very bright. Um, unlike some of the original ones like this one here, it's very dull and dim. And that's because those have been done since the manufacturer. So those are more modern solder joints. And, and you, can, you can see other telltale signs of this being worked on you know, since its birth date 70 years ago. This is a piece of heat shrink tubing that looks very modern. Um, you can see more of that if I turn this around. Uh, here, you know, this is, this is kind of a dull joint. Uh, that's a dull solder joint. Uh, but certainly there are others that are bright, like this one right uh, get it, get it in here, right here, very shiny, uh, and some of the others. So you can kind of see a, um, a technical history of what has been done to this radio just by looking at the solder joints and the wires uh, that, are, that, that connect uh, pieces of this. So some other things that, that that I found just by looking at the schematic. Uh, first of all, uh, well first of all just in general if you look at the way these tubes are marked on the schematic uh, this is you know this was published in 1942 uh, and this the the tube symbols are are not the same symbols that uh, followed in the in the 50s and 60s uh, the uh, you know the grid and the cathode uh, symbols are oriented differently or are actually themselves different and it just takes a little getting used to. Another convention that that you saw uh, starting in the late 40s and early 50s is that in schematics you would have pin numbers next to the pin, next to the tube symbols but you don't have that here uh, and so in order to deal with that it's really helpful to have a, uh, a tube manual, a receiving tube manual. Um, you can get these now um, 
you know, for, you know, this was a buck 50 when it was produced in the early 70s. Uh, I think now you can get them for, you know, a dollar or dollar 50 uh, from used bookstores. It, it literally costs more to send them to you. Uh, so these are, these are really helpful. They just have, you know, all the pinouts for, uh, for the different tubes and the uh, operating characteristics and so on. Okay, so getting back to this radio, in the power supply section, you have this 35Z5 uh, rectifier, uh, half-wave rectifier, and you see that there's an LC filter on this, which consists of two capacitors and an inductor. And the inductor here is, when the radio came from the factory, was actually associated with the speaker transformer. Uh, in this radio, remember we saw and remarked that um, this structure right here was presumably done as a repair at some point. Uh, and in fact, um, I, think that, I think that is exactly what happened. And I think this entire assembly here uh, is a replacement that obviously did not come from the factory. And the reason I say that is if you look down here, uh, this resistor feeds in between two capacitors on this can. <clears throat> now, this can uh, actually contains three capacitors, uh, and um, the values are uh, 15, 5, and 10 microfarad and it's rated at between 350 and 250 volts depending on the specific cap in the can. Um, you see on the schematic where there's just two capacitors listed and even though C20 and 21 don't appear up here in the parts section uh, from the Beitman manual, uh, the writer's manual, if you get your microscope out, has, has them. And they're listed as uh, 20 microfarad electrolytic capacitors at 150 volts. So there's quite a difference there. So this capacitor, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, pretty confident in saying that was put in uh, as a repair at some point. And this resistor right here that, uh, that ties these two capacitors together, there, that should have been where this inductor was. But instead, it's a two kilo ohm resistor. Um, and notice that this inductor had a resistance of 450 ohms. So, uh, make a long story short, somebody has had trouble up here, uh, presumably. They probably had not the uh, exact replacement that was called for from the factory. Uh, so, they made an assembly work. Um, and this section wasn't present, so they converted this ripple filter into an RC instead of an LC filter. Uh, how they picked 2 kilo ohm, I don't, don't really know if there was a rationale behind that or if um, that's just what they had on hand. I'm probably going to replace that with a 2 kilo ohm resistor, uh, and I'm going to get rid of this and replace it with two uh, 20 microfarad capacitors. Uh, so we're going to not restore it exactly to the factory specifications because I don't have the right uh, audio transformer uh, to do that, uh, but we'll get it back uh, as close as we can. It's just one other thing that uh, I'll say before jumping in and actually starting to make some of the repairs, uh, and that has to do with the antenna back here. So this was in the days before you had ferrite loop antennas in AM radios. So this is essentially, you know, a long wire antenna uh, wrapped around uh, in a circle so that you had some directionality uh, to it. And remember we uh, replaced what was an old, literally moldy, uh, which was funny because the brand was mica mold, uh, moldy wax capacitor in here and I changed that. And uh, I made this remark that if, if you check the continuity from here to the chassis, well, from here to here, that it was continuous. And so if you ended up touching somehow 
you know, this end of the capacitor it was so leaky that you would have been in contact with high voltage. Uh, looking at the schematic here, you can see uh, you can see that, that that's true, but you can also see something interesting about the antenna circuit. Uh, so this is the capacitor in question, C3, and you can see up here that it is in fact a 0 0.002 microfarad uh, uh, condenser capacitor. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> you know, this is a mess. You look at this and it's kind of gobbledygook. You don't really know what to make of it. But if you follow it around, this is the external antenna connection, right? And I'll show you. So that's this hole right here, okay? So you would connect a wire to that, and that would connect then to one side of the capacitor, and the other side of the capacitor would then go down into, into this mess some way, and it's really hard to follow the wires from that point on. Uh, but, but you can see on the schematic, uh, if, you, if you're careful, so here's the external antenna connection, here's the capacitor that was replaced. This goes down, skips over this, and goes around back here to ground. So in fact, this should be continuous with the chassis. Uh, but this inductively couples with the looped wire on the back of the set, all this. Um, and so if you put an external or a long wire antenna on this, it is not connected directly to the, uh, to the input here, to the RF amp. It's actually inductively coupled through through this antenna. So that's very clever. Um, I never realized that. All right, well, we'll wrap this video up and uh, just go over what we've learned so far. Uh, this is a, a radio that, that dates from the early 1940s or, or possibly late 30s. When we opened it up, it wasn't obvious uh, although in retrospect it is that this speaker assembly and the audio transformer on it were not at all original and that in fact they've been put on to replace the uh, the speaker circuit that was uh, not a permanent magnet speaker but rather relied on a, uh, a field produced uh, from uh, from the power supply so an electromagnet and in fact, if you put a, a screwdriver on the back of the speaker, uh, you, can, you can see that it is a permanent magnet speaker. And uh, that was a, a technology that didn't really uh, come into common use uh, until, until later, uh, much later than this unit was, was produced. So uh, there we go. It's uh, always good to, uh, to learn and to look around a lot uh, before you start uh, soldering and desoldering and, and, and changing things. I, I think that it's very interesting to look at what, what I think of as the technological archaeology of, of these things. You know, they're 70, between 70 and 80 years old in, in this case, and, uh, you know, if you're a human and you're 70 years old, you've gone to the doctor and probably had several things repaired, and, and, and these things are no different. Uh, looking at the repairs in the past that, that other technicians have done is uh, always illuminating and, uh, and, and interesting. So in the next video, I will have gone through and changed the uh, multi-section electrolytic capacitor and uh, the resistors that have all drifted out of uh, tolerance, out of value, and we'll have cleaned up the chassis a bit. And uh, then we will begin in that video to look at how to get into the uh, IF transformers, the IF cans, and deal with the rubber rot on the leads. I hope you found this interesting. If you like it, please give it a big thumbs up below and we will have part three to follow uh, probably in a, in a week or so.